Systematic theology was probably one of my favorite classes when I was in Bible college. It, for those of you who are not familiar with that kind of study, it's topical theology, if we could say it in that way. So you don't necessarily pick up your Bible and read Genesis through Revelation and, and get your theology that way, but it, it will take maybe uh, angels, and you'll talk about angels for several amounts of weeks, and it's called angelology and different things like that. So it's systematic theology, a study of systems or topical theology. We discuss certain aspects of Christianity until hopefully everybody in the class had kind of settled on what they believed Scripture had said on that particular topic. It, the class was my favorite for several reasons. Firstly, um, it was taught by one of my favorite professors, Dr. Bruce Barnes, who has taught here a couple, he's preached here a, a couple of times here at New Hope Church, and uh, he's just a, a man that I, I am so respectful of, and I'm, I'm thankful for his ministry, but he was a great professor. Secondly, it was one of the few classes that I was able to actually take with Rachel, um, she is a much better student than I am, by the way. Uh, it turned out to be a huge blessing early on in our marriage because I don't think I can relay what a blessing it is to be able to sit in a class, a theology class, with your fiancé and know that the same theological bedrock to your, to your marriage and your parenting philosophy, it equals out. And that was one of the things that God just kind of surprised us with that blessing. We saw in our first year of marriage that it's not like it was, you know, it wasn't a marriage course or anything like that. But we had the same level of understanding about what we believed about Scripture and how it infiltrated all of our life. And so we weren't making horrible purchases because we had the right understanding of the biblical principles of stewardship that we learned in that class. And so it was, it was a blessing to us. But it was also my favorite because it was one of those classes that made you think deeply about spiritual matters. It sparked good, wholesome, loving debates that actually taught me more about my faith than any textbook ever has. And I know this morning I dogged those people who debate, but this really was, it was good, wholesome debate where I learned more about Christianity and my faith because of the brothers around me. But Dr. Barnes, in all of his wisdom, he had a rule that he lived by in that 401 class, systematic theology. The rule was this, no discussing the subject matter outside of class with underclassmen. That was the rule. No discussing the subject matter outside of class with underclassmen. He wasn't trying to hide anything from anyone. In fact, it was really years of discernment shining through. There would be topics that we discussed in that class that we had to build up to. And without that groundwork laid and steadily built upon, some topics would prove too difficult, too ground-shaking to younger Christians who did not have that bedrock. And so he always encouraged us to not discuss the subject matter outside of class with underclassmen. I saw this principle play out right before my very eyes because while Dr. Barnes had his rule to live by, we had ours in the dorm. And that was discuss everything that we talked about in systematic theology with the underclassmen to make us look really smart. Well, it all came to a head one day <clears throat> after a weeks-long discussion about a very boring topic, dichotomy or trichotomy of man. Essentially, I'm not going to get into it, but essentially, is man made up of two parts, body and soul, or is man made up of three parts, body, soul, and spirit? Okay, that's kind of the basic idea there. Well, we had talked about it in the dorm with several underclassmen, and we did our best to make sure that they felt that this was a really important subject and that we were surprised that they had never thought about this before, even though none of us ever had until we were taught it in class. Uh, by the way, it's not an important subject. I hope you're getting that. This is not, does not have any eternal significance to it. One of the underclassmen, though, had taken it all to heart, and he had tried to work through this in his own mind. He read everything that he could on the subject, and he was so confused by all the points, pro and con, that we had made concerning both sides of the views. He was distraught over his inability to decide whether or not he was a trichotomous or a dichotomous. So in what could only be called as an extreme act of desperation, 
he banged on the classroom door that Dr. Barnes was teaching another subject in down the hall, and we hear him in the middle of this class interrupting Dr. Barnes, you have got to help me figure out if I'm a dichotomist or a trichotomist. (laughs) The next systematic theology class was not the most pleasant experience, (laughs) neither were the multiple papers that we had to write on spiritual maturity that followed over the next couple of weeks we had broken his rule. Well, We've been talking about spiritual maturity and especially along the lines of knowledge and self-control this evening. We've been working through 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5-7 through 7, the last few Sunday evenings, but <coughs> they've been spaced out. So I want to try to start this evening by reminding you of all that we've already gone through as Peter is encouraging believers to go deeper in the faith in order to withstand the coming wave of heresy that has already started trickling in to the early church at this point, okay? So remember, we have flipped the list of verses 5 through 7 upside down in order to get the impression that Peter is trying to convey that each of these builds one upon the other, okay? Faith, you see faith there on that list. It is the bedrock of Christianity. Faith is the absolute bedrock of our Christianity. It is the E on the I chart. It's the whole reason that the Bible was written. It was there to produce faith in Christ in you. It's the most important thing for every person to to gain in this life. If you do not have faith in Christ, then there is no reason to go any further along in this study in 2 Peter chapter 1. Every other principle and discipline stems from faith. Remember we've said, I've said it multiple times, alive things grow, dead things do not grow. So faith that is genuinely living will have these other disciplines growing from them in the life of a Christian. Virtue is the next on that list, and we defined it as moral excellence. But we also spent a lot of time talking about the importance between, the important difference between moral excellence and moral perfection. We think moral perfection whenever we think of virtue, but it's also good for us to know that we will never be morally perfect this side of heaven. I know that surprises you, that you are not morally perfect. Hopefully it doesn't surprise you. But we can be morally excellent through our relationship with Jesus. He is perfect. He is morally perfect. And through him alone can we ever have the right sense of morality in Christ. Last time we were together, I preached the third from the bottom, knowledge. And I I further defined it as biblical knowledge because I don't think that Peter is necessarily talking about mathematical and other these, all these other topics and subjects that we need to learn. I think he's talking about biblical knowledge. It's the idea that as a Christian grows and matures, then there will be a desire to read and study God's word even more. Underlying throughout this discipline is the truth that we have to do the work of gaining biblical knowledge ourselves. No one can spoon feed us biblical knowledge. It is not something that you sit on a pew with your mouth, your heart's mouth open and you just say, okay, Corey, feed me. You must do the work of biblical knowledge. And we talked about that a few weeks ago whenever we talked about Peter saying that you be the choral master. You be the one who gathers all of these traits under the wing of your mature Christianity. I I mentioned that we live in an era where the Christian has more resources at his fingertips than ever before. Public libraries, church libraries, online resources, apps, all of these, they boast some very solid biblical teaching that no other Christian throughout history has ever had access to. But we do. And the sad indictment is that we hardly use them. I I said it, uh, I have more Christian resources on my iPhone 5S than Martin Luther had at his hand when he translated the entire Bible into German. And yet I don't use them like I ought to. 
I ended two weeks ago by urging everyone to move forward in their biblical knowledge, not just as a a rote memory of facts about the Bible, but allowing the Word of God to dwell in you richly, like Scripture says. I encourage you to read it, to meditate, and to use it in your everyday life. Ever since I've been directing high school week at camp, I've tried to encourage Bible reading among our students. The most prevalent excuse that I and you, culture as a whole, gives as to why we do not read Scripture more is that we don't have time. Now that's an excuse, and it's not worth much, but let me just, you know, say I hear that. We are busy people, and adding one more thing to your daily schedule it usually is just going to throw everything else out of whack, especially to the new Christian who is just getting into the faith and and they're trying to bring in a quiet time, a devotional time, a, a Bible reading time. They're looking at their schedule and they think, I have no time to do this. Well, at high school week, I I try to make time for scripture reading during the morning sessions. I usually try to leave anywhere from 8 to 20 minutes where they can, students can sit in the conference center, they can go out on the porch, they can sit in a swing nearby, and they can just read the Bible. Sometimes that is the first time that a student has ever picked up a Bible to just read. I heard that this week. Every year, I get the most encouraging feedback from high school students, some saying that it is among Several students in a group told me that 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 time is among the top five things that they look forward to doing at camp. We're talking about a place that has a giant swing and creek hikes and laser tag and all this stuff. And they said that one of the top five things they look forward to at camp is just time where it's not debatable. They just pick up a Bible and they read. I oftentimes reference this infographic. I have it here Uh, with me. There's no way you'll be able to read that on the screen. I understand that. But I have about 30 or so of these out at the welcome desk that I encourage you to pick up. It's an infographic that Crossway put out, I believe, two years ago. Um, And essentially what it does is it, it, it says, it gives you the time that you can read every book of the Bible in. Would it surprise you to know that you could read each book of the Bible or you could read every book of the in under five hours. There is not one book of Scripture that exceeds a five-hour reading mark. Were it not for Psalms, we could say that each book could be read in less than four hours. Twenty-nine books of the Bible can be read in less than 20 minutes. Is that, do you feel that? 29 books of the Bible can be read in less than 20 minutes based upon an 8th grade reading level. The study is done. And yet, the excuse still stands for many of us. I would read my Bible, but I don't have enough time to do it. The fact usually blows people away because we look at this big leather-bound book and we kind of get a little intimidated by it. We don't know where to start but viewing it through the, through the lens of how many hours or minutes it will take me to read a book of the Bible, it makes it so much more doable or accessible. And so like I said, I encourage you to go by the welcome desk and pick one of those sheets up. If I need to print off more, I will. So faith produces virtue and virtue encourages biblical knowledge, but here is where we're going to get to tonight. Self-control. Self-control. It seems more like a principle that ought to be taught at a Weight Watchers class than after an encouragement to read Scripture. So why does it come where it does on the list? Read 2 Peter 1.5 with me again. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness. Let's hold off there. I think that self-control follows biblical knowledge because Peter knows 
immature Christians all too well. (laughs) He has just told them to be voracious readers of the word of God. And if you know where I'm going with this and you've seen a young, immature Christian, knowledge is a great thing, but knowledge in the hands of a person who doesn't have any self-control is a very dangerous thing. And so that, I believe, is why he writes that wisdom or self-control must accompany biblical knowledge because without it, we fall prey to a number of dangers. I'm going to list three of them this evening, but I'm certain that there are many more. And I'd also like to add that these three specific dangers, they're not really found anywhere specifically in the text of 2 Peter chapter 1, but I do believe that the original intent of self-control falling where it does in this list is to keep us from these dangers or dangers like them. So let me give you these three dangers that if we are not careful, we will have biblical knowledge without self-control and then we will fall prey to these dangers. Number one, the danger of academia. Now, don't misunderstand me. Don't misconstrue my point. Academics is important and we desperately, desperately need biblically literate preachers filling our pulpits and Sunday school lecterns all across America. But one of the biggest dangers of hoarding Bible knowledge and neglecting wisdom is that we lower the Word of God to something less than a textbook. And it is so much more than that. We reduce it to facts instead of truth that weaves its way into our everyday life. When I was a senior in high school, I took a collegiate level night class in order to kind of get a jump start on my Bible college career. It, it was an Old Testament survey class, and probably like all night classes, that class had some, a very, had some varied groups of people in it. We'll just, they're just a little different, okay? Um, one of the men came to class with one of those Bible trivia books. He came to a collegiate level class with a Bible trivia book, you know, almost a big pamphlet, and it, I don't know the name of it, but it was entitled something like, you know, a hundred little known facts about the Bible that you didn't know, you know, something like that. There's nothing wrong with those books, but they are far from practical, especially when they're not even in the syllabus as part of the course. And he was bringing it as part of the course. Well, it came time for the first exam, and before class, all of us, we had our textbooks handy, we were cramming, we were jotting down a few notes in order to get some of the concepts of the terms down. He was in the back of the class, and you guessed it, he's reading that little book that listed genealogies and other things like that that we didn't even talk about in class. The exam was almost completely essay, (laughs) and he he had that pamphlet memorized to a T, which is sad when the the exam is an essay. So we had to explain certain attributes of God in the Old Testament, and we had to expound upon their New Testament significance. We had to kind of use the knowledge that we had and and give it in in a concise manner. And the facts and figures of a pamphlet like book like his didn't help him one bit on that exam. I remember looking back at him, and he just sat there, pen in his hand, staring at a blank page, not doing anything. He had forgotten that the application of biblical knowledge is key to maturity. It is absolutely key to biblical maturity. I read of one pastor who, in his frustration, he said it best. He said, I have a ton of professional Christians in my church. When I tried to start an evangelism ministry in our church, I had 10 volunteers to teach the class, but not one of them showed up to go visiting or pass out literature. They could tell you what was the best way to evangelize, but they weren't willing to evangelize. And what they had done is they had watered Scripture down to a textbook instead of the very living Word of God. The danger of academia presents an 
unnecessary dissection between what you know about the Bible to how you live based upon it. Anyone with a mind to do it could read the Bible and memorize it, and that's important, but wisdom teaches application. You might be able to memorize the Ten Commandments, but if you're not living, if you're not willing to live by the Ten Commandments, they are worthless to you. And wisdom or self-control teaches that to the person who's trying to gain biblical knowledge. Which that's a, that's a perfect segue into the second danger of biblical knowledge without self-control. That's the danger of hypocrisy. I put off to the side of my notes, pride. You guessed it, that we see the danger, this danger, best lived out in that group that Jesus contended so vehemently against throughout his public ministry. The Pharisees. Jesus didn't hate these guys. Don't read the gospel accounts and think Jesus just had a chip on his shoulder against these Pharisees. He loved these men, but he hated what they did to his word. They clung to the letter of the law and they shunned any kind of grace or empathy that is presented all throughout the books of the prophets. I mean, you just read Hosea alone, and while adultery is a horrible sin, you see the idea behind adultery and and staying true to God and how he follows and chases after you. They had totally thrown that idea out, and they just stuck to the letter of the law. They didn't see God's word as a love letter sent to heal the hearts of his broken people. They saw it as a stringent list of rules and laws whereby a person could achieve a higher position in both this life and the next. It's like Jesus said, they had strained at a gnat while swallowing a camel. (laughs) They were dissecting and debating the smallest portion and additions of scripture, all the while missing the very point of the law. Love God. Love others as yourself. They could memorize it and they could spout it out, but they weren't living in love with God or in love with their neighbors around them. They were the most undiscerning, unwise, uncontrolled group of religious people ever because their biblical knowledge skewed their reading of the law, which told them that they were totally justified in having the Son of God, the author of the very law that they claimed to know and love so much, put to death. They cited Scripture when they said that Jesus should be put to death. They had the knowledge. They didn't have the self-control. They didn't have the wisdom, the discernment that ought to accompany knowledge. And we, today, we stand in a very real danger of that same hypocrisy. When correct application and self-control doesn't accompany biblical knowledge, which that leads us to our third and final danger of biblical knowledge apart from wisdom and self-control. It's the danger of division. The danger of division. I wrote off to the side of my notes, (laughs) pig-headedness. You want a surefire way to make sure that you're going to divide over the smallest thing and you're going to be pig-headed about every little meticulous preference that you have about church and religion? You read the Bible for facts and you don't allow wisdom and self-control to involve your life. In my view, this is probably the biggest danger that modern Christians face whenever they dissect wisdom from biblical knowledge. Recently, Claire, she fell and she fractured her arm, her left wrist. And when she got home from the hospital, she showed me her x-ray. Zoomed in, it showed just a tiny, tiny splinter of a bone, smaller than a toothpick, sticking out of her less her left wrist bone. When I was thinking especially about this issue tonight, I thought about that x-ray. And I started thinking, what would the body of Christ, what would the church look like if we were given an x-ray? 
we would have more fractures and breaks than anyone in the worst vehicle accident of all time. The danger of division is not that we don't stand for truth. Please understand that. I hope you, you, you get that we cannot fall away from the undebatable truth of the gospel. If that's the issue, then, then they're not Christian if, if they're debating the gospel. But it's that we divide and we fracture and we splinter over so many little dumb and petty things that truly don't have one iota of eternal value. I'm not talking about ecumenicalism. I'm not talking about how we ought to, all the churches in the world ought to disband and we have one big church, local church. In many ways, I, I believe that denominations can actually unite the body of Christ in a, in a very real, tangible way. I'm talking about drawing a line in the sand over preferences and debatable biblical issues where there ought not be a line. A readiness to cause division rather than protecting the integrity and reputation of another brother in Christ, that is a sure sign that you have not applied self-control and wisdom to your biblical knowledge. Please hear me, and I want to be as respectful as I can because I love the way I was raised. But I grew up not even knowing that there was a whole other group of free will Baptists in this world. Because we had drawn lines over preferences and things that didn't matter. We had died on hills that was not Calvary. And when we do that, we fracture and splinter and break the body of Christ. And it is many times because wisdom and self-control is not applied to biblical knowledge. So it's true in our movement. It's true in our churches. We see it every week whenever we have churches that disband over ridiculous issues. People that think they're so important that they'll, they're willing to split a local body of believers over some petty issue. And it's true in every part of our Christian walk. There are three dangers if we do not have this right idea of self-control and wisdom coupled with our biblical knowledge. We will divide over senseless things. We tend to be pharisaical and hypocritical. And we'll tend towards academia and facts and figures instead of faith. So to our Bible knowledge, we have got to apply wisdom and self-control or we make it more about facts than faith, more about knowing than doing, and more about preference than the very Word of God. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence Add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But the same is true in verse 9, or the opposite is true. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. So read your Bible, know your Bible, fall in love with your Bible, and allow it to absolutely change everything about who you are and how you act, but with that biblical knowledge, add a heavy dose 
of self-control or wisdom, knowing that there is a great fight in this world, and it's not among Christians. It is among not flesh and blood, but principalities and powers, princes of this age.